Cool, thank you. Um, so I guess I only have 20 minutes now. Uh no, you, you have you have 40 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's a uh, overall is a uh, half an hour, uh, one hour and a half, right? Yes. The whole yes. seminar. Okay, great, great. Mm, then yeah. Great, thank you. Uh good morning or good afternoon. Um as uh, Dr. Xia has already introduced, I'm Dr. Xu, and I'm now working in the University of Cambridge. And uh, my, top, my, my research topic here is the data science and digital technologies for carbon data management in the whole life of highway assets. Uh, I'm going to introduce like a little bit of, of uh, my research and our program, and then talk about uh, the background of this research and uh, the gaps and uh, problems in the practice that I identified and then what I propose uh, as a solution to solve this problem. So different from Dr. Zhang's uh, talk, which is very technical on the material side about the low carbon cement, uh, mine is more from a management or data and information management perspective. Um, the, so it's targeted at the whole um, whole sector. It's more like a system level of research. Uh, first of all, my research vision. Um, I see our construction projects as a cyber physical social system, which we uh, as now we have all these digital technologies and. Uh, uh, human as a part of, of this system as well. And then we have our physical world. So this, all the cyber, physical and social systems are connected with our human there. And uh, within this, this complex system, we have data flow, material flow and the process flow that connects and mobilize the systems. And uh, I, in my, in my overall research, I want to uh, answer the question about how to adapt our data process and material flows in the CPSS of the construction projects to modern construction methods and the digital transformation. Because as we know, we are all in the in the journey of in adopting more modern construction methods and also the digital transformation. We have new materials being uh, invented. We have new technologies that we are trying to use. But, but if our organizations, our projects cannot adapt themselves to the new requirements of the new methods and technologies, then there would be some uh, chaotic or chaos that will cause um, the, the low efficiency or even uh, like uh, in, in our in our uh, in the in, in this process. That's why uh, our sector is so uh, is it's a it's one of the least digitalized and the and the one that is so um, so dragged uh, so dragged back and also with very with with low productivity. So I see that is uh, the key of the where one of the key reasons the problem lines. And I think um, so to solve this, we need to we need to streamline and adapt uh, our data process and the materials to this to, to this new technology. So that is my overall vision of, of for my for my research career. And um, now I'm uh, and I think data is one of the key uh string that can help us uh investigate the material and the process it, data can tell us the story of of the cyber physical system and how it how the new technology impacts it and how it should how, what is the problem and how it can be improved so that's that's uh kind of my approach uh to see uh our sector and the the world and uh, my research is going to focus on this. And uh, that's, that's kind of said the thing about why I look at data and what is the uh, overall picture of my research. And in that my previous research, I 
I have explored a lot in different aspects of this, uh, including uh, my research at HKU. We have used have tried using digital technology to bridge the data flow between the cyber physical and social subsistence using the IoT, BIM, and blockchain technologies to try to achieve the data-driven decision making and even cognitive intelligence in our uh, facility and building management. I also studied the organizational digital transformation, especially from the process flow perspective, how these technologies impact the coordination or other process in, in our organizations and how organizations can better fit for the new technologies with the human uh, consider with human skills consider. So I developed that human organization technology fit model for the new process uh, adaptation. And also from the material perspective, I have studied some of the waste material um, flow and also now uh, focus on the carbon, but still they are uh, they are connecting. This project is trying to connect in what I wanted to do and bring it to a next step to a more like systematic solution. And uh, as Dr. Xia has mentioned, I'm working on this Future Road Fellowship Program. So it is a program that is co-funded by the EU Marius Godaska Career Fellowship uh, Program and also the a consortium of industry industry companies in the UK, in, uh, le led by the National Highways, and this is a vision of of our whole program. So it is actually uh, two programs. The digital road program is a is a UKRI program, the EPSRC program, and then the future road is a other program funded by EU and in and the industry, and. Uh, we have five topics in this program, the digital twins, smart material. Uh, so Dr. John's research is kind of part of here. Uh, and then automation and robotics, data science, and sustainability. So sustainability is something that is added to the digital road, but is in the future of the part. And my research works, works on the carbon part of, the, of, of that, but I, I have other colleagues working on maybe more like um, infrastructure system level. But yeah, that is the whole program. And I'm very happy that I can work with people uh, from these different perspectives. And my research is kind of bridging all these different to uh, different topics together. Um, and this, as I said, it's data science and the digital technologies to, to, to for the intelligent carbon management. And uh, the problem that I try to solve is that I, by engaging with the industry um, people very closely, I found out the existing carbon reporting relies on a lot of manual input, which is very tedious with a lot of uncertainties. And uh, also labor intensive data is not in, uh, in it's not accurate, reliable, and the level of detail is very low. And so it is kind of not really usable for decision making. So that causes the, um, can we trust the data that we really collect? Can we really use this data? That problem. So uh, I try to answer, like solve this problem by answer two questions. Firstly, is what is the fundamental carbon data model for an intelligent carbon management system? What like a more intelligent carbon management system needs as the data input and how to increase the trustworthiness, automation and the timeliness of carbon data reporting to support the informed decision making. So yeah, that is the like where my where my research lies in my own vision and the vision of our program. And then I'm going to uh, introduce like a where it says in the in the industry. First of all, we all know that there is a huge emission gap if we need, if we want to achieve we want to maintain uh, the, the the global temperature to one point uh, five or two uh, degrees. We need to we need to uh, 
reduce 15 gigatons of CO2e or to 23 gigatons. That's a lot. And uh, maybe the number, that's just a number, but the, what does the number mean? That means like if we were using uh, reinforced concrete, uh, 25, 20, 25 or 30 as, a, as, a, as an example, we need to use 100 and uh, 108 or to 207 gigatons less of this concrete. And still you don't have um, any idea what that is. That's, that's, I did the calculation. That's like the volume of more than, more than 6,000 three, go three gorgeous dumps. Sorry, the two threes. So that is a huge amount of, of, um, materials or like uh, emissions that we, we, we need to reduce. But how, how can we achieve that in the next uh, six, seven, six years? And we all know that our infrastructure and building, building and infrastructure sector plays a significant role in the carbon emission. And we, so that we have the we should take the responsibility to reduce um, the carbon emission. So this is a report from the United Nations about how infrastructure, infrastructure sector influence on the targets of the sustainable development uh, targets. So all this, including the building and uh, transport, water, energy, and waste management, and digital communication, all these infrastructure sectors adding together, they impact 92% of all the targets. And, uh, and, uh, they con and they adding together, they contribute to almost 80% of all the emissions. So that's, that's, that's why we need to act now. And, uh, and, uh, of course, the governments and uh, the industry, they have realized this problem and they are taking some actions. Like in the UK, they have the they have developed the past 2080 carbon management in infrastructure. That is the 2016 version. And uh, in the uh, updated version last year, um, they updated it to the carbon management in buildings and the infrastructure, so you in include the building in it. So this is the key um, guidance. It's passed, it's called publicly available specification um, that used to guide the industry to um, to manage the, the carbon. So this is kind of uh, the... Um, the guideline for the whole industry here, and not not just here. This past twenty eighty has 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 its impact not just in the UK but also uh, in other area in other countries as well. So um, it says it says how uh, this says the guidelines about how to manage carbon in the infrastructure and building sector. It. Uh, it is about how we can manage carbon to reduce the whole life emissions in the built environment, but it did not give us uh, like uh, the method to conduct a detailed appraisal of wider sustainability. Uh, that's fine. So it's focused on the uh, carbon and uh, it emphasizes the consistency in the process of carbon management, but it, it, uh, it, it does not give the prescriptive uh, GHG quantification or assessment methodology and data gathering. Some other uh, in some other um, standards, in this, uh, international or national standards have mentioned that a bit. And uh, it's about the consistency in framing the whole life carbon reduction, both within the control and the influence of value chain. And it's about decarbonization for increasing value. So it's driving the whole life carbon reduction, but it does not uh, uh, taking the cost management into, into um, consideration. But actually what companies cares a lot or what 
can we can incentivize them is is to um is through the coast is through the the but then if we if we separate the carbon and coast it's it is a bit problematic when we really want to implement and uh, incentivize the so organizations the companies to take the actions and also it's about how to demonstrate the capability for integrating carbon in decision making when delivering projects and programs but it's not it, it, it is it there are the organizational certification to get the past 2080 accredited uh, accredited accredit date date but um, it is more focused on how to increase or demonstrate the capability of of integrating carbon in the decision making and uh, one of the figure in this past 2080 show that and this is i think not just for carbon but also for other um, other aspects of, of a project. At the very beginning, in the need uh, identification and the operational stage, we have a, and even design stage, we have a bigger, uh, we have a higher ab ability to reduce the whole life carbon. But that's where we have, a, we have, we don't have much data that can support us to do the real decision make the the more granular granular decision making, but and uh, with with the time uh, going on at the later stages of the project, we have less ability to reduce carbon, but then we can also we at the same time we can collect more and more data, more detailed data, to assess um our performance in this. So um. So this is kind of like, like a, a, like a gap there. Um, how can we make use of the data that is accumulated at a later stage, but also use it for a earlier stage of of to have a bigger impact? That's in. So if we if we just look at a project a pro a program, we cannot a single project program. We cannot really maximize uh, the use of data for our ability to reduce the carbon. But if we look at organization level or like uh, supply chain level, network level, we can make use of what we can collect from like earlier project and apply them for our future projects. And uh, and that is how um, we can we can get. Uh, more data for for use more data for this, uh, for, but but um, the problem is that currently we lack this kind of um, long term investment or industry level uh, kind of system level industry level solution to to really invest in that to to keep those data for our future. Use as much as possible, and uh, also this past twenty eighty has uh, has um, provided the requirements on the carbon monitoring and report uh, and reporting for all value chain members, um, like what they should do, how what they should report at different stages. Um, so it's kind of. Uh, Ask them so you can see generally from from these requirements, it's at a very general and high level. Um, if you are if an organization looks at this, they they kind of know what they should do, but they don't have a specific uh, guideline, very specific like protocols about how how to do how to monitor and report the carbon emissions in construction how to identify and report where the greatest carbon emissions are so that's all need to be like data driven they need to monitor and report the data right but what format of data what kind of data and how they identify this based on the data so those are this so there's a gap between this standards and guidelines and uh, what industry can do. 
So, um, so that that is that is uh, as I said, the gap where it is. And then, we, if we zoom in into the like one sector, such as the highway sector that we are working closely with in our program, they have they have the strategy, the net zero plan, like for national highways, they want to achieve the corporate uh, net zero by 2030 and the maintenance and the construction net zero by 2040. And the, even the road user net zero by 2050. And to achieve that, so I, I work very closely with national highways, and my project is more targeted at this second net zero uh, target, at the maintenance and the construction net zero. How they can achieve net zero uh, that includes the material manufacturing usage, transport of material, and on-site activities. And to really achieve that, we need to know where the most emissions comes from, where we can, where are the, the so-called hotspot, where where we can uh, reduce a lot, where are the low carbon opportunities, how the low carbon materials impact, um, impacted and how it can be used, how it can be uh, maximized, how it can help us to um, reduce our emissions in the maintenance and construction as much as possible and uh, and so that we can achieve this net zero target in the next decade. So that all needs the support of data. But uh, currently, um, they have some carbon construction innovation programs, which they use to identify and define the challenges and opportunities and the innovations. And uh, so, and they also have the carbon management system, which you can see still, um, it is a lot about, uh, the, the, it's, they, they look at the carbon management process, how the activity and the process of each stages um, can be improved, how, can be quantified, and uh, how can they be uh, through how it can uh, incentivize the game, like the carbon management, carbon reduction through procurement or supply chain, how to set the baseline targets and monitor it in a more specific, measurable and time-bounded targets and uh, reporting and assess, uh, and also tracking this with transparency. So that is what they wrote, they want to do. So I have identified this, but then it still stays at that very high level and it lacks uh, lacks the method approaches that can touch the ground at the construction site about how to do it. And that's where um, I think the gap is and that's where um, my research sits. So it's under this under this layer and it has this continuous improvement um, part. So it's more like how how we can really achieve that in uh, how we can um, instruct the site managers um, and also procurement managers in selecting the new materials and uh, you know environmental sustainability managers in their uh, monitoring and assessment of the carbon management. Uh, a little bit more than if if we want to talk talk about the measurement, the reporting of of carbon, we need to understand the methodology that we are using now to measure or not measure to assess to assess or estimate the carbon emissions. So we all know that this different different categories categories of methodologies. This three scope specification, uh, three scope emissions is kind of the widely uh, widely talked, used, because it, it is developed by the uh, GHG protocol, and uh, it is um, targeted for, for organizations to report the, the, the carbon emission. 
So it has three scopes, the direct, uh, the direct emission from the company's facilities and uh, vehicles, like the fuel they use and the direct uh, like power generation. So it's very, it's very, it's very small, very specific. And uh, the scope two is purchased energy, like purchased power, purchased heating and cooling, purchased uh, steam, these things. So, so for many organizations, maybe the scope one is just zero if they don't uh, produce, if they don't, if they don't pro pro they don't generate the energy or they, have, they don't have the on heating and cooling, um, but it just produces. So that would be zero. And, but then they have a lot like a scope too. But then you can see that as the upstream activities and downstream activities, um, what like an extended supplier, like an company's extended supplier, a supply chain would impact. Uh, it includes a lot of different activities, including like the leased assets, the employees commuting, the purchase goods and services, the business travels, waste transportation distri uh, distribution, and the use of the sold products. All this, um, and then the life of treatment of of of, of their products. This, this is this is a very big part. It's about eighty percentage of 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 the whole emission, but it's very, very difficult to measure now, simply because we don't, it's very difficult to have the data. And uh, also um, there is there's another like mes kind of a methodology from a product's perspective for a product it has like different stages from material acquisition to production, distribution, use and end of life um, stages. And this is how um, these different stages can be mapped with the different scopes. So we can see the scope one and two, like for organizations that have its products is more focused on just the production of the product, but then the material acquisition, the distributing use and end of life is not include like it belongs to the scope three and uh, it's not measured or reported and uh, yeah this is a this this is a more more specific on the product carbon for, for the printing stages so as we said the scope one and two at this um, production stage but the exploration of material and uh, the later stages are um, it's more like we can do the crandle to gate, um, but not the whole crandle to grave um, measurement of of emission. And uh, in in our sector, which is more project or asset based, um, we have this life cycle carbon modules that um, the carbon of uh, projects is. Um, divided into embodied carbon and uh, operational carbon. So we have the upfront carbon um, from the pre-construction product and the construction stage, which is also the crandle to, to gate um, stages. Um, but uh, then we have the in, we also have the in-use operation, user, user carbon and end-of-life carbon um, that is currently is currently uh, especially this part is currently not measured or reported, really. So, um, so there is still a lot of gap gap that, uh, like we don't know what we don't know about we don't know much about these parts. Um, our focus is more from like A1 to A3 or like A1 to almost A1 to A5. Mm, which means from raw material supply to the manufacturing or at, at most to the construction and installation processes. But because of the the because of the like the timeline of a project and also the interfaces between uh, the supply chain. So 
at the construction, production, construction stage and the use and operation stage, we have different stakeholders taking care of them. So there's a lot of interface that makes it also very difficult to, to, to continue to measure and assess. So that gives you um, like an impression about how like our current method methodology of carbon measurement or carbon assessment looks like and uh, where we are still unclear about. And plus what I said, uh, we have we have such a complex value chain with so many stakeholders. So like 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 you if you have played this game, um if you are trying to pass what you think, like you describe something to one another and pass it to uh, another. And the, if the chain gets longer and the, and the idea just gets gets more and more uh, drifted away from the original one. And that is how like the data is being shared or not really clearly communicated to the other stakeholders so that we don't know what is the fact uh, or it is uh, of, of our real carbon emission or it is just something becomes a fake number. So that's where that's where um, this whole this whole problem, uh, the landscape of, of, of the problem looks like. And then if you look into the carbon calculation. It is normally like um, activity. Now we do an activity or process-based calculation. It requires the data of activity and uh, the emission factors. So this is a very long list of the uh, uh, different types of data that we need to collect, including like bulk material, fuel and energy and water and uh, construction works, furniture equipment, business and employee transport, waste generation, so much, so, so much data to be collected and they are all in different formats and how you, how you specify what each type of data should be collected, what, what time, by whom, and also the emission factor data. Yes, we now have, we now have many like commercial or or governmental databases of the carbon emission factors. But do you know how this data comes from, from life cycle assessment, right? And then you know that in life cycle assessment, there's, there's a lot of assumption on the boundary, like the, what is the boundary? What's the system boundary for that life cycle analysis? What, what uh, processes, what stages has been taken? And so it's, it's, it's a lot, it's like very complicated also in these emission factors. So there's a research about um, how different the selection of the different emission factor database can impact um, the result of like a single thing uh, activity. So the result can be like very different, like double times. So can how can we get this data right, both the activity data and the emission data right? Mm, and what let, let's let's look at what the industry is doing. It's using right now. Like this is a national highways carbon tour that has been used since twenty ten or over a decade. All the industry people, all the national highway people I've talked to said this. This tool should be outdated. This should be replaced by a new material, a new tool that is more automatic. But still, in the practice, they are still using this Excel file to to to, to do the reporting. They need the environmental environment environment uh, managers to ask people to provide them the data at a quarterly basis. And uh, the environmental managers told me that we sometimes it's very difficult to get the data. You people don't reply to email. They don't. Uh, you have to guess. Um, you have to make assumptions. 
and you don't know like how much uh, material is wasted on site. You you don't know exactly what type of of very specific type of the material that they're using. So you just so it's a, it's a mess. It's it's really a mess. And uh, they also have the low carbon opportunity register, which uh, do the register possibility opportunities to reduce carbon like the new materials, low carbon materials, or other potential um, methods, something like that, 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 that it can help them to reduce the carbon. But there is no data to support to what extent, what is the what is the potential uh, of the low carbon, uh, the, the, the carbon reduction? There's no number, no data to support that. So it, it looks like a, like also a spreadsheet like this. You can see that. So it can say something like, what is the, uh, it has a, says the potential carbon reduction from not replacing and from no maintenance required in the future or need product to sign again. So when you read this, you actually still have no idea how much how much carbon can I save by using this low carbon opportunity? And uh, yeah, and this is how the embodied carbon library looks like. Uh, they have they have the univer universally unique identification for each item and for each resource. They have um, like. A, like they have a resource list, they have code for it, they have description of what it is. And uh, so they have the modeled carbon factor. And uh, so it covers the A1 to A3 cradle to gate and some of them would cover A4 and A5. And then they have a total A1 to A5. Then as I said, the B that are in use and the operation stages they cannot do it now. So all this, all this, it's just, uh, it just made me feel, um, this is a very compli complicated problem and, and really where, where um, we need to start with a solution is from the data. And, and the, in the practice, the data is produced is produced in multiple places with inconsistent approaches to coverage. Um, what does it mean? That means um, so they have yeah they they have maybe design drawings. They have the procurement system. Um, the they have some reports uh, about the environmental performance, but how? Um, uh, how to reduce the data collection while also uh, collect as much data that, as you need. And also by in, in consistent approaches, I mean different stakeholders, different parts of the supply chain, they use different approaches to, to collect and to measure. So, and, and the coverage is different. Some of them just A1 to A3, some A1 to A5. Uh, very unclear, very inconsistent, and the, the they have different coverage, diff using different emission factors assumptions. So that is that is that is um cause a lot of uncertainty or confusion, and uh, but the thing is, since they started to to look to 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 look at this, they have they have. Mm, data that is produced, but it is just placed somewhere while not being used, not being really uh, reported. And also the current whole life cost calculation is not linked to the base estimate at a detailed level. What does that mean? That means um, companies, they wanted to do um, is still like cost based calculation, and then they add the carbon as like a, as a as a, um, another dimension, but but it's not linked. That they are not linked together. So if you choose, if you change of the any of the design, or if you change any of the base estimate, it will not 
or, or, or something, it will not be impact, uh, updated together. So you need to do another round of baseline or like another round of estimation. And um, that that is just uh, still like not being um, pre pre used or um, not being displayed or uh, presented in 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 the new like if you have new we we all know that we have different we have our our designs our selection of the materials are being changed all the time but then if this is not re reflected how you can really know understand what 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 is being changed and what is real carbon emission and all so they, 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 they really need a prescribed carbon accounting method but that's, that is a major gap that have been it has been recognized but still not being really being developed and uh, they want to uh, produce quality project level whole life carbon data across all the product carbon footprinting stages but yeah it's, it's not there yet and um, so um and also what about how how they can the standardized output formats should look like they want to have like a project estimate summary of uh the past 20 ac emission categories which is like the a1 to a5 all this um um categories and along with key metadata like like what are the scheme name and what are the stages cost opening year or a uh, lot of the data that they wanted to collect, but it's still not there. And they want to um, do it like from an asset level, uh, project asset level, aligned with the work breakdown structure. That's, you know, that work breakdown structure is, is has, has, been, has been used um, in the construction like practices for a very long time. So it's, it would be good if we can align the carbon um, data along with uh, WBS. So we don't need to create something like a new category or something, but we want to uh, to break the structures to approximately level four, more detailed, more granular. And uh, yeah, so how to do that, like how to give, how to get a line by line report of with fully uh, work breakdown structure detail is like the, what they want to and uh, to target at. They want to have live data and uh, with a data hierarchy of, of from, from the whole, uh, whole, whole supply chain and the portfolio, perfor program scheme and WS and the resource level and um, data would be grouped into slices such as different year scheme tier emission type something like that so that's um that is that is what um I found by a lot of a lot of engagement in interviews engagement observations and the reading uh, diving into all the materials reports in the in in the industry and um, and uh, try to figure out what a data uh, what the carbon data measurement or report should look like um, what 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 industry wants and what we can what we can have with them and uh, then um, in this January I organized. Uh, this design thinking workshop called Trustworthy Carbon Data Collection Methodology for Highway Assets. So it is uh, attracted more than 60 industry experts uh, to attend it. Uh, the industry experts from the, the asset owner and developer manager and uh, designer, contractor, uh, material and, uh, and uh, service providers. So it was a whole four day workshop um, with a lot of very focused on the carbon data collection in in the in the industry. How can what is the value 
of this? Why do we want this? And how can we do this? Where we are now? Where, what, where we are heading to? So a lot of insights, uh, a lot of uh, constant, con a lot of agreement uh, achieved here. And I just want to share some very, very key takeaways from this is uh, all the industry people agree that the key pain point, pain point is the lack of data and especially lack of data consistency. So in my in the intelligent carbon management system that I want to develop, I want to increase the data availability and the data co consistency. And uh, more specifically, they want to have the quantifiable carbon data at not just the asset and the project level, which is like the currently what people what projects do, but they also want activity level data. So that will be considered in the data requirements in this uh, intelligent carbon management system. And the lack, there's other aspects of the problems like lack of leadership and investment, fragmentation of, and differentiation of the value chain and the technology awareness and readiness. Um, so that is something that I will consider in developing this um, system like as a context, but might not be um, like a main research objective in my current project, but of course that is very important. And if anybody's interested in those parts, I'm also um, very interested to explore and collaborate on that. And uh, to collaborate and uh, increase the willingness to share data and align carbon with cost um, and uh, work with le legislation and education spaces to overcome the barriers is also being talked a lot. So data sharing will also be a significant part that will be considered in this uh, system architecture too. Uh, but after how we collected the right data. So uh, I have I've talked a lot about um, the background and uh, what the problem is. And then, um, yeah, and this is this is just a simple, also a carbon like data flow with a use case for how data is reported, collected, and what are the problem lines at each step. And uh, still, the data availability, data quality consistency are two are the major problems. And the calculation based LCA method have uh, been used something of the, again, the, the, the problems. And uh, so it links back to the problem and the research questions that I, I have mentioned before how, uh, what is the fundamental carbon data model should look like to, to solve all these problems? And how can we increase the trustworthiness, automation, and timeliness of carbon data reporting? Um, some some, some uh, published work, including the white paper um, with industry partner, and uh, the industry has, um, has acknowledged that this, this white paper is very useful for them um, to understand and the problem and how where where should I head to? And then um, a conference paper at the CIB W78 and the EC3 last year about the uh, carbon data trustworthiness framework for the construction sector. And um, so the concept of the carbon data trustworthiness is to uh, we should consider the cap, the data availability, quality, compatibility, and the security, which which may also include uh, many other data um, re relative concepts. But overall, to improve the to in, in improve the trustworthiness of the carbon data, we need to consider this uh, different key key ideas, and uh, we need to consider. When we design the carbon data model, we need to uh, specifically consider the standardized data structure, more clear uh, stakeholder responsibility, what they should do um, in collecting and the data and the streamlined data collection procedures, automated data collection methods, how to track, uh, track the data flow and share the data, um, share the data 
and also um, how to evaluate the reputation of the of the pro data provider, and also how to ensure the data quality um, by purpose driven by the least data points. We don't need how much data do we really need? What is the minimum data requirements? The reasonable accuracy. What level of accuracy accuracy we need, and uh, and how to what is the right collection and update frequency, and what devices and methods can we use? Are they reliable, and uh, the format uh, should be consistent. We need to have third party verification, and uh, more importantly, can we have a common data environment? To, to to understand the data protocols and open data formats to improve the data compatibility and also how to ensure the data security through distributed storage or role-based data report and access and sharing and analysis and other data encryption technologies. So this is uh, kind of the pro the principles the principal technologies that we can use to ensure the carbon data trustworthiness, and uh, with that, all this uh, in considered, we can then try to make as much as possible of the current data uh, that is available from different sources that was not. Uh, specifically developed for carbon, but for other purposes. But then we, how can we make use of them to to this by uh, by a standardized way? Be yeah, with a carbon with a very clear and uh, a common carbon data ontology and the metadata structure, so that we can um, we can format all this data from different sources in the same, like in the unified format in a common data environment, and then uh, make those um, data in a item by item level with a very standardized. Um, standardized, standardized format. Each line with the same thing, uh, but with different data. And then that's where um, this is the key part that I'm working on, and I think that is significant to uh, for us for our carbon management decision making in a lot of the uh, applications, possible applications. Um, that industry needs. So I think this is uh, a very fundamental research that can support a lot of um, research uh, from from the AI or data science. Um, this is like prescript provide the the sources data the, the trustworthy data source for all these applications. And currently I'm working on developing the carbon data ontology. And uh, so this is part of it and explore use cases um, from the concrete steel, the uh, fewer um, perspectives and also develop the asset carbon information requirements to include carbon in digital twin. But this part of the work has not been published yet. So maybe if you're interested, you can, you can like check uh, um, like keep uh, check my profile like occasionally to see if they are out and uh, I'm happy to collaborate in these uh, aspects and if you want to know more about our next steps of what we are going to what 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 is a possible pathway to um, the possible the explorations of technologies with one of the companies that I collaborate well. It's like how to calculate and uh, share the carbon data with this technology. There is a uh, DRF launch clinics on June the, 4, the 7th, which is three weeks later. Um, and uh, to get that information, you can follow our Digital Roads of the Future LinkedIn uh, 
LinkedIn page and they will share this information in the due time. So yeah, um, so there is no conclusion for my research because it's still going on. I spend a lot of time to understand what was the key problem and uh, what is a possible effective solution, fundamental solution to this. And there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, um, welcome all different types of collaboration. Um, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you.